Uh, so continuation marks is something that's been around in Racket for a long time, and this is this talk is meant to be both kind of a, a recap of that long-term design work and also a discussion of some recent implementation work. So most recently collaborating with Kent Dibbig, um, but over the, the couple of decades before with John Clements, Gongyu, Robbie Fendler, and Matthias Felleisen. So I'm going to start with, uh, with a motivating example. Suppose you're opening a file, so you've got some open call in your programming language, then of course you supply the file name, but there's a lot of extra uh, optional stuff you might supply, like whether to create the file if it doesn't already exist, um, whether to create it in binary mode or text mode. Um, you could add all of these things as arguments, but there's also something that's usually not explicitly an argument, which is the current directory that you're working in. Um, you, maybe maybe that should be a bit of uh, argument that you pass in somehow, but you wouldn't want to pass it in everywhere. And the way it's usually done in, at the operating system level is every process has a notion of its working directory. Um, and that's not what I want in this case. The reason I don't want some process global state for these optional bits of configuration, like the current directory, uh, is because I might have multiple threads in my program. So maybe one thread is supposed to be working in my directory, and another thread is supposed to be working in Alice's directory. So that suggests at least thread local state. But even thread local state is not really that nice because if I want to temporarily work in Bob's home directory, then I have to worry about maybe there's an exception, and so I have to set up some way of uh, reverting back to Alice's directory as I escape. I have to use an exception handler, or if you're in scheme, uh, dynamic wind, something like that. Um, I might have multiple little continuations, uh, little coroutines there. So maybe I'm using iterators um, or uh, generators. Generators is the word I meant to say. Um, or similar things, or maybe even capturing continuations. Um, so again, those different generators that are running, they might want to be working in different directories. Uh, and that, again, is why thread local state is not very good. I would have to have generator local state and so on. I might have uh, fragments that I capture or that are futures. So a future might run in parallel to other things. It doesn't run in any particular thread. And Racket a future, if it does need something about a thread, then it just has to wait. It can't run in parallel. But we might want to adjust the current directory still in a future while it's running. So for all of these reasons, I don't want thread local state or global state. I want to take this general notion of continuation, some computation that's proceeding, and I want to attach my current directly, directory uh, directly to that continuation. So this is for things like current directory or the current output port. There are all of these things that are effectively dynamic variables that you might want to temporarily adjust, but you want to attach that adjustment to the continuation. So that's the general notion of continuation mark. It's a motivating example, um, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how continuation marks are used in various ways. Uh, in Racket, if you are actually changing the current directory, uh, you use um, this dynamic variable, current directory, which is called a parameter in Racket terminology. It's a terrible name, but we inherited it. Um, parameters are set through parameterize. So parameterize here is going to set current directory while it's calling shuffle files. And if shuffle files calls something that needs to resolve a path to a complete path, um, then it will look up the value by calling current directory as a function. So this is the sort of language level protocol for dynamic binding for things like uh, the current directory or the current output stream. The way it's implemented is that it's uh, converted into a continuation mark. So the actual form is with continuation mark, but I'm going to abbreviate on the slides with with mark. So with mark here is mapping the key current directory to home Alice. And then when I want to look up that, then I use the, the other side, the other half of the primitives, uh, current mark. So current mark will uh, get me the current directory is most recently set through with mark. Uh, more generally, I could get all of the current directories. So if I have nested calls uh, that set the current directory, I could get all of them using current marks. And then in this case, I just want the most recent one. So uh, I would use first. So with mark and current marks, those are the, the primitives that we use to build parameters uh, for things like uh, the current directory, but many other things as well. And this is a, a selection of things that are implemented with continuation marks. And they all have somewhat of the flavor of either a kind of um, dy dynamic variable, 
uh, dynamic binding or generators where you need to go find the right yield uh, or security checks where you need to, to see whether you're in a context uh, that allows things. Um, and then some of them are more generally the inspection of the current continuation. Um, exception handlers are an example of that, and I'll, I'll run through that example in a little more detail. Or profiling, where you need to look in the continuation and see what sequence of calls, uh, what nesting of calls led you to this particular place. So it's one building block uh, that lets us build these different kinds of language features. And of course, in the racket world, that's what we're trying to do, build different kinds of languages on top of a base and exploring that through macros. Uh, but also, you need the, the runtime components to, to be able to write the, the right kind of macros like exception handlers. And uh, things like closures are a part of that, and continuation works are a part of that. Please jump in at any point with questions. So um, are there any questions on this setup? OK, I'm going to go into uh, another example. Oh, question, yes. Uh, I do have a question. Are you going to show us the semantics of continuation marks? Yeah, so after I set up some examples to motivate it, then I'll go a bit more into the semantics. Okay. Um, yes. I've just kind of waved my hands and said they exist right now, uh, but that's the sort of middle part of the talk. All right, so I'm, I'm just hoping you have kind of this idea that you're attaching things to uh, the continuation and looking them up. And uh, by looking at another example, we can see more how we want that to work. Uh, let's, let's look at exceptions with catch and throw. So I'm going to implement um, a catch, which sets that continuation handler, uh, not continuation handler, that sets this exception handler um, to catch any exception V and just return it in the list. And then I've got the body there that uh, would normally be returned. Uh, so catch returns the value of its body unless that body and its dynamic extent triggers a throw. So in this case, um, since we do throw in the body, then the handler function gets that, and so I should get lists uh, the symbol none out. Okay. So what I want to talk about is how to implement catch and throw. Uh, catch looks like some sort of uh, macro here because it needs to set something up before it evaluates its body. Um, but uh, the key part here is the, the continuation mark that we want to use to communicate from catch to throw. So I'll make up some new value catch key. I'm using GenSim, which just generates a, an opaque fresh value. We don't care what it is. Uh, we care that it's just some fresh value that no one else is going to see except the implementation of catch and throw. And then here's the, the catch macro. Now there's a lot here. So I'm going to break it down and at first ignore the call CC part. So what we have in the white area inside the gray box um, is a function that gets delivered to that opening parenthesis right there. So this function, ignoring the call CC stuff for the moment, just gets called, which means that uh, this macro's result is going to be produced by this with marks form, yeah, the expression that this, this macro is used for. Uh, with mark. Uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, but it's going to set escape key to that function and then evaluate the body and return that. So ultimately, the result of a catch form is normally this body expression here because it's in that function that gets uh, delivered to the outer paren. So far, so good. Okay. Meanwhile, call CC is going to bind escape to that same outer parenthesis effectively. Right. Whenever you call the escape function, it's going to deliver its argument to that same outer parenthesis. So this lambda down here, an argument to escape, also might get delivered to that opening parenthesis and called. Uh, and if that happens, then the result of the catch form will be handler applied to V. So we have these two possibilities, body or handler applied to V. One or the other of them is going to deliver the result of the catch form. And the one that happens depends on whether this function that's attached to the mark escape key ever gets called. And of course, that's going to happen when throw is used. So let's go over and look at throw. Here's a first cut at throw. Uh, throw takes some value to throw as an exception. It uses current mark uh, to get the value of the catch key. Uh, current mark, let's say it returns false if there is no mark. So if escape plus handle turns out to be false, then we'll just say unhandled exception. But otherwise, we apply escape plus handle. Uh, which is supposed to escape and then return v uh, to the catch form. And we're expecting that throw is used in some continuation where a catch key has, a, has been uh, mapped to one of those escape plus handling functions. OK, 
Okay, so this is a useful catch and throw already. It always throws to the most immediate catch though. So in this case, um, my, my continuations are growing down. Stack is growing down if you prefer. Uh, so I'm gonna find the most recent one there, which is escape plus hand one. Um, but what if that, that exception handler doesn't really want to deal with the exception? Um, we might look deeper in the continuation to get escape plus hand two, uh, escape plus hand three, and so on. So let's refine our throw so that instead of just always dispatching to the immediate uh, exception handler, uh, we would have to pick it, fix up catch to, to adapt more generally, but throw could use current marks and get all of these, escape plus hand one, escape plus hand two, escape plus hand three in a list, and it could try them one at a time. Uh, and if one doesn't escape, then we end up trying the next one and so on. For each is gonna walk through the list um, of escape handlers. Now we could have done this differently. We could have mapped a catch key to a handler to a list of handlers, right? And always extended that list. But by mapping it to individual marks, if we capture some segment of this continuation and use it later, uh, then that segment keeps the handlers that are supposed to apply to that segment. Uh, so hand three, for example, doesn't have a direct reference to hand four. Uh, it implicitly changed to the next one in whatever context it's applied. So that's a, supposed to be an example that uh, shows why we want a little bit more out of continuation marks than just dynamic binding. Um, we want to also have it serve roles of, of inspecting the continuation more generally. Okay, so uh, I'll stop for questions on that example, but just to tell you where we're going, next thing I'm gonna tell you about the semantics of continuation marks. Uh, then I'll start talking about the implementation of continuations and continuation marks. So before we go into that part though, is there any other question, any question about this example? All right. Okay then, finally to answer the first question, which is the semantics of continuations. Uh, I'm gonna do that mainly with pictures. So here's an example expression, which of course adds one to the multiplication of minus three times two. Uh, we could take that expression and to evaluate it, we need to start out by subtracting seven minus three. And after we get a result from seven minus three, we deliver it to the multiplication with two. So I'm gonna draw that with a square around seven minus three because that's what we wanna evaluate now. And then I deliver the result of that into this next step where the square brackets there, the hole in that next frame is where the value goes. And I can keep drawing this picture uh, by putting the plus one with a hole at the end because that receives the result of multiplying by two and draw some arrows in. So the picture on the right-hand side of the equal sign, that has the same information as the expression on the left-hand side of the equal sign. It's just made the continuations, the, the frames of the continuation, the steps that we have to do, uh, made it more explicit in these bubbles. Uh, and now in, this, in terms of this picture, when I subtract seven, minus three, I get a four. That four gets delivered to the hole in the next frame. And then I multiply four times two and get eight. Uh, that value gets delivered to the next frame and so on. So it looks like a call stack with returns. Um, and a call stack is one way of implementing this. Instead of arithmetic, I'm going to write everything Lambda calculus style with just function calls um, to, to talk about the semantics. So the same sort of picture here. Um, this says apply that identity function lambda xx to v3, deliver that result to be the, the function called with argument v2 and so on. So if I reduce uh, to the beta reduction there, lambda xx applied to v3 and get v3, it goes in as the argument or actually as the function and v3 applied to v2 and so on. So why did I set up this notation? Well, I set it up so that we can talk about things like tail calls, for example. So here I've got lambda x e1 for some more complicated expression e1. And the way these pictures are supposed to work is when I do the reduction and get some e2 by replacing x with v3 and e1, then that e2, since it's not a value yet, if it were a value, it would flow down to the, the next frame. But since it's not a value yet, then we keep it up here in conceptually the same square box. Right. So that's tail evaluation. We're not growing the continuation as we call this function. Uh, we just start evaluating the body of the function. These pictures also let us talk about continuations. 
So call CC means we're going to capture the continuation. This is the, the primitive continuation function. Uh, it captures that continuation and delivers it as K to the function that you supply to call CC. So in other words, we capture the continuation, which is all the bubbles after the square in our picture, and that gets substituted in place of K. And now I have a funny kind of picture where I've got a function call, but the thing in the function call position is, is a continuation. And um, this is just a typical convention of overloading functions and continuations, uh, holding, overloading apply for those two things. But when we apply a continuation, that means uh, with call CC, we throw out the old bubbles and just drop our new bubbles in place. And the argument to the continuation gets delivered to that continuation. OK, so that's continuations in terms of pictures. Uh, any questions on this part, this notation? There are some variants of continuations. For example, there's a notion of composable continuation. So if you have composable continuations in your language, it must give you some way of capturing it uh, um, other than call CC. So maybe uh, call with composable continuation or call slash comp, I'll abbreviate it here. Uh, composable continuations fit in these kinds of pictures because uh, the meaning of composable is just that you don't throw away the old bubbles. You splice on the new bubbles with the old ones um, and then keep going as before. So composable is kind of an attribute on the continuations. Uh, you can also do things like delimited continuations, where we have another primitive in the language now, prompt. Uh, prompt says that when you capture a continuation and you're, you're keeping all of the bubbles below the square, you, you stop before you get to this circle, this prompt circle. So call, it affects both call comp and call cc. Uh, just the limits all continuations. Uh, so now when I have call CC and I capture the current continuation, it's only up to the prompt. So it's just that bubble V2. Yeah. Um, and then when we uh, apply things with delimited continuations, uh, the prompt also delimits what gets replaced. So this is a non-composable continuation. We'll throw out the part to the prompt and then drop the applied part in place of that. So I'm not going to go into too much detail of, of delimited composable continuations. There are some more details, like you could have prompt tags, which uh, let you have sort of different overlaid uh, kinds of, of delimiting. Um, I just wanted to say that these things exist. They fit into this notation. Um, there's a 2007 ICFP paper that goes into more of it. And continuation marks are going to be compatible with all of those things. Uh, so we're really talking about continuation marks with delimited and composable continuations. But um, it turns out that if you just think about the call CC primitive and build up all these other things, that works fine in practice. So I heard, uh, heard that there's a question. Uh, go for yeah, it. Yeah, me again. Um, so does it make sense to have delimited continuations that are not composable? Uh, yes, but it does not make sense to have composable continuations that are not delimited. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> so suppose you had a composable continuation, but it's not delimited. That means you capture everything, including the exit that's at the very end. And then you try to compose that continuation, then you've just composed on the exit, so nothing interesting happens. So they tend to go together because you need to delimit things to make composable worthwhile. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I often heard the terms used interchangeably. Yes, right. Uh, so having non-composable with delimited, um, it's it's a little bit ugly. So in, in racket terms, the implementation has to deal with non-composable ones with more work than with composable ones, because there are weird things that happens on the boundary. So if you're doing a, a language from scratch, maybe just leave out the non-composable ones and just have composable delimited continuations. But for so historical so, reasons, really, we, we considered the whole scope, the whole spectrum. So the non-composable delimited ones, sorry, the, the, yeah, the non-composable ones, that's when you, uh, sh shifting, right? So, so you, you uh... Yes, shift, uh, shift reset, that is, um, uh, wait, no, those are composable. Let's see. No, they're not composable. You're right. Shift and reset. Um, uh, I always have to page all of these these different terms back in. 
I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I, I'm not sure, but but maybe it's a distinction between shallow and deep handlers, just because of the people who do handlers in the audience. So so, so uh, yeah. it makes sense to have shallow and deep handlers in some situations and so on. So so maybe it makes sense to also have uh, composable and non-composable. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, this is just well, it's, your it's easy. It's easy to get non-composable ones from composable ones, um, as long as you have some sort of a board operator, I guess. Uh, I, and I left that out too. So in addition to prompt and prompt tags, you can have a, a separate abort operator that just throws away the current continuation and goes to the prompt. So yeah, which pieces you need to get all the other pieces is a somewhat interesting question. Uh, people have gotten it a little bit wrong, in my opinion, in the past, and that like shift and reset and F and prompt are not quite the same. They don't quite express each other. Um, at least shift and reset. Don't express F and prompt if you're worried about tail behavior, for example. Right, but but I think I think uh, oh, or you are wrong in the sense that uh, shift and reset are composable. They're not. Okay, they are. Yeah. So when you let's see, reset, uh, which is the one that's like prompt, it's shift, right? So I thought composable just means you you stack everything on top of the current the current continuation, right? Uh, yeah, so actually, I thought, I thought oh, reset, no, I think you're right. I think reset I was wrong. mean yeah, throw yeah. away the current continuation? Yeah. Reset is like current segment. Yeah. shift, sorry, res yeah, reset and prompt are analogous, and then control and shift are analogous. Yeah, but I think control is the composable one, and shift is not. I think they're both composable. I yeah. think I was actually wrong about this. So, so, OK, let's, let's take yeah. this off. I'm sorry about the way in there. That's right. The Every time I wonder this, I go to the racket slash control library and reread the implementation, because they're all sort of implemented in terms of the primitives I can keep in my head. Um, but yeah, there are sort of interesting questions for our purposes. Uh, this, is, this is relevant here. If I have a call CC primitive, I can get good performance and, and all the operators I want by using that to build the next layer, to build the layer that has prompt and a revised call CC that works with prompt and a call comp uh, and continuation marks, as we'll see. Okay, so that's why that's why I'm mostly going to use call CC, even though it's kind of the least favorite of the control layers in the sense that it's it's the least uh, composable and, and, and nicely interoperating uh, because I can use it to build the others. So finally, we can we can move on now to continuation marks and the semantics of marks. So here I've got the with mark form, um, showing my example with current directory and home Alice. Uh, but let's just generalize to generally keys and values. So some arbitrary key represented by v7, an arbitrary value represented by v10. The way with mark works is it takes that v7 and v10 and it, it attaches it as a little badge on the current continuation frame. So that's why the v7, uh, v10 attached as a badge there. So this is a new part of the graphical notation. After with mark does that, then it evaluates its body in tail position. So in this case, the body is another with mark form uh, that's evaluated in the same continuation frame because it was in tail position. Now here I have a different mark, a uh, different key, v9, v11. So what happens in this case is that my badge grows to have two different keys mapped to two different values. So in general, on a particular frame, I have a dictionary mapping keys to values. Uh, and then we evaluate E1 in tail position here. But if I can say, instead of V9, if we had V7 again, um, then what happens is just what you would guess, the V7 mapping to V13 is going to replace the V7 to V10. Right? Now, this in some sense is an arbitrary choice, but this choice makes continuation marks uh, reflect tail evaluation in a way that makes it useful for building all sorts of other um, all sorts of other language constructs like dynamic binding and exception handlers and so on, right? So that is the semantics, just the, the defined property of continuation marks, but it's defined because it works nicely for things, uh, which is that on the same frame, a key value mapping gets replaced. On the other hand, if we take this variant where I've got with um, nested with marks, but this time the inner with mark is not in tail position. So I evaluate that outer with mark, I get V7 mapped to V10, now I won't start evaluating the body, which is an application, and the argument is not yet a value. So I need a new frame to start evaluating that argument expression. 
when I get a value back, I'll deliver it to the yield width. But uh, in this new frame, I evaluate the expression with mark uh, v7 and v11. Now nothing gets replaced. That's a v7 on a new frame mapped to v11. The v7 mapped to v10 on the old frame is still there. And then I'll start evaluating v1. Okay, this, that's pretty much it for, for the definition of with mark. Um, and then the other half of things is current marks. So these badges are um, uh, sort of the, the obvious things happens, right? Current marks looks, given a key like V7, it looks through the badges to find all the ones that have the matching key and collects up the different values in a list. And the, the order matters in the, in the list. The more recent uh, frames, they have their marks uh, first in the list. If the name of the current marks also had a, uh, a mark on it for V7, then that would be included in the list as well. So current marks, when it ever, whenever it matters, uh, it includes the current frame as well as the rest of the frame. If we had prompts, then prompts delimit the result of current marks. And if you have tagged prompts, then the prompt with the corresponding tag delivers current marks and so on. But the, the essence of the idea is, is the same. Uh, so that was it, the whole the whole new, uh, the whole whole cement that was right there. So I'll pause for questions again. So, so the marks let you observe the the, the division into frames. So that's that's a very low level division, right? Yep. So, so it would stop me having all kinds of. I mean, this is all dynamic, but but all kinds of optimizations to do with how do I draw the, the frame barrier, right? So in, in learning certain things would start uh, to become observable behavior in terms of continuation marks, right? No. So um, okay. it does constrain the compiler, but it doesn't cons but uh, it's sort of like, so there is the semantics of the language, which says that certain things are in tail position and certain things are not. Um, and the compiler has to be consistent with that and what it, what it reports for marks. But this is sort of the, the end of the talk where we talk about, well, the compiler can see the width marks, and that's that's the point of building it in far enough. Uh, it can still do optimizations to the degree that it doesn't change the observable behavior of marks. See, so so just, optimization just, now has to be aware of whether there might be a continuation mark. Absolutely. Uh, and only if it's not there, then you could, you, okay. Yeah, Thanks. and to make that concrete, I had to change Shea scheme to be aware of this. Like, if you had let x be expression in x, the Shea scheme optimizer used to just change that to the expression. But that moved a non-tail call, non-tail expression into a tail position. Um, it didn't bother anyone before because it just made your program use less space, asymptotically less space possibly. Uh, but now it's observable potentially. Uh, so now the uh, the optimizer has to look at that expression on the right hand side and say, if I move this in tail position, will anyone notice? And it just can't move it if someone could. Thanks. So it's it's part of that's that's why it's important to build it into the semantics to get the right kind of cooperation from the compiler. Another question. Uh, me again. Um, so you have with mark and current marks, which uh -huh. are the primitives for manipulating these marks. Um, what are the other continuation primitives you you have? Are you you're just just saying call CC. Uh, at this level, let's suppose we just have call CC with mark and current marks. Yeah. Right. And that would allow you then to define any kind of control operator you want. That's exactly right. Yeah. So slightly more precisely, the right primitive is not current marks, but an iterator that will let you step through them. Otherwise, current marks have to might have to do order length of the continuation work. But that's what I would say are the, are the primitives, call CC with mark and iterator over current marks. And are they, is that just sort of historical accident because you already had call CC or would you choose? Well, other... yes and no. Um, I think I'm going to say yes, mostly. So we were, it's a historical accident in the perspective of this talk and that that's what Shea Scheme provided. Um, I think, I'm not sure if I would do anything different if I was starting from scratch though. Call CC is kind of a natural thing to have at the compiler runtime system level. It's kind of the simplest thing you have there. Capture the current continuation or replace the current continuation. That's it. Um, and we can build prompts and, and everything on top of that. So it's, it, it's 
it's one or the other. <laughs> I'm saying I don't know in a sense, but I kind of suspect that call CC might be the right primitive for the, for the, an eager language, eager mostly functional language. I guess the the, the concern is that that call CC well without all this continuation mark stuff anyway, you, you capture the entire stack of, of the entire continuation, but you not want you are you. All the, right. <laughs> I'm going to have to take it back a little bit. You're absolutely right. In fact, I also changed Shea scheme to have call in continuation and to expose the null continuation so that I can get the right delimiting behavior. Right, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yep. So you don't want, you want call CC, but not just overload function call to do a certain thing, but have call in continuation, which lets you substitute, uh, which lets you provide a continuation, but also provide a thunk instead of a value to deliver there. So if you have the one that lets you provide a thunk instead of a value, you can get slightly cleaner um, uh, delimiting. It saves a few instructions. OK. Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. Sounds like people who have been thinking about this before. Uh, let's talk about the indirection of call CC and marks. I don't want to call off questions, but I think uh, so jump in if I, if I misjudge, but I think we're ready to move on. Um, Call CC with marks does exactly what you think it would do. We were capturing those bubbles before. We capture them with the uh, with the the badges intact. Um, and then you'll notice that I didn't capture this badge here because if we just have continuation application, then there's no way this badge could be observed. You would be delivering a value, so we don't keep it. Uh, all right, that was the whole interaction of call CC and marks. The, basically, the graphical notation just makes it fall out. That's uh, how the notation is designed. On the other hand, this is a little misleading because every time I capture a continuation, I've been copying these bubbles, right? And of course, you don't want to do that. What you really want is for call CC to just grab the current continuation. Conceptually, we've copied it. We've made a copy, but you know, it's they're just we want them to be immutable things, so we just grab a reference to it. And then when we grab that reference, we can substitute it in, in this case, as the argument to v3 and so on. v3 will go on. It'll do something uh, who knows what. Um, eventually, uh, control may return down to this frame here. This is where the pictures I've been drawing are slightly misleading, because I changed that oval into a square, like I mutated the frame. Um, so we're not actually going to mutate the frame, because if we did, that would change uh, the continuation that we captured uh, through a reference. Uh, if we actually mutate the badges uh, when we do with mark, then that would mutate the continuation marks in the capture continuation. So I need to be a little more careful with my picture if I want to start talking about a more efficient implementation that doesn't just copy the bubbles. Um, uh, so let's change the way the picture is drawn in a couple of steps. The first thing is, um, because when I capture continuations, um, I don't want with marks to change the badges on a frame. Uh, let's put those not actually attached to the frame, like as, as, a, as a mutable frame changing with badges on it. Uh, we're going to put it in a separate uh, stack that runs in parallel to the regular continuation frame stack. So in this picture, I have a new marks register that lives at the same level as the current frame register. Uh, and we're only going to mutate that register. We're never going to mutate the badges. If we need to extend the badge, we'll just functionally extend it uh, by allocating a new badge. Uh, we want to add a new mark to something. Right? Um, so marks uh, then points to the current continuation marks. The current, current marks operation really would just return that reference. Um, the current continuation operation would still just return this reference. And notice that every frame then refers to both the next frame and the marks that should become um, uh, current as we return from that frame. Right? So the way you read this uh, yellow arrow here on the right means that as we return to this frame, uh, this first uh, with a whole frame, uh, the marks register then should be updated to point at that other frame. Right. So now uh, I'm not tempted to to mutate the marks frames as much. Uh, question? Sorry, so so the the list of marks, uh, each value has its own list. So it's yeah, each parameter name. I don't know what, what's the right terminology for. Uh, so seven, there's, there's one list of all v7s, another list of all v8s. There's going to be, there's gonna be one list of uh, dictionaries, yes. So each dictionary. So if I have v7 and v9 as keys, does, is that what you mean? 
Yes, so, so the yeah. separate lists or the yeah. one list? Okay, good point. So that's why current marks doesn't just return this marks. <laughs> yeah, current marks has to prune this list, prune the dictionaries to, to just a key. Um, yeah, so I oversimplified there. Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess I was. My question was whether you have multiple lists on the marks, one for each value, yeah. or, or it's no. one big list for everything. It's mm -hmm. one list where each node in the list is a dictionary mapping keys to values. All right. Thanks. Yep. Uh, now, in this picture, also every frame uh, refers back to a marks list, even though it doesn't change every time. Uh, so this is some overhead in our frames. We're requiring every continuation frame to have an extra pointer. Um, that's like that's adding an, an extra word to every frame in your stack, see? which is not terrible, but we wanted to make the cost even lower um, because continuation marks change much less frequently than, than frames get uh, uh, added. So the actual implementation is a step closer uh, like this. Uh, we have these special frames that we insert only when we need to change the mark registers. So when you're returning from this frame to this one, you don't need to update the marks register. It's only when we went from this one to this one um, uh, from the current marks frame through this extra special frame to first that we need to reset the marks. Uh, so these extra frames are inserted, uh, as we'll see, as we add to the mark stack. Uh, in fact, this, this picture is still a little misleading because it suggests heap allocated frames. Uh, where we're really going is a stack implementation of the continuation. Okay, so I've gotten closer to the, the right implementation in terms of functional update here, but now we need to talk about how to implement continuations uh, more efficiently using a stack. Okay, so now I'm really jumping back to a 1990 paper just as a refresher on how uh, Shea Scheme implements continuations. Um, when you have a call CC and this stack-based implementation, uh, then we're going to need to make a copy of the stack because uh, because we need it in the future, even if control returns to the rest of the stack. Uh, but we don't have to copy it eagerly necessarily. What Chase Scheme does instead is it does a kind of lazy copy. We'll copy the stack when we want to return to it, uh, so we don't have to copy it on capture. Uh, there's a kind of copy on write when we uh, when we apply it. So we split the stack and we just say, okay, now this this new place where the call CC frame is currently, uh, that is our new stack, and we'll work from there. Uh, and for the continuation, we'll just keep a, re a reference to the old stack. In case the capture continuation is not actually applied, we also need to say that if you return from this frame, you'll also return the same way just by copying the old stack. So continuation invocation and returning, they're the same thing, copy the old stack. And this may sound inefficient, but uh, with suitably sized stack segments, it, it works out to be pretty efficient actually. Uh, especially if you're trading, you know, most of the time you're not capturing continuations, um, then this this can do better than a purely heap-based uh, strategy. Um, so when we apply a continuation, we copy the stack. That means we'll copy that uh, old stack into our current working stack uh, and deliver the value that we applied there. Uh, in that case, there's no more reference to the old continuation anymore. We threw away um, uh, any references in this picture, so it can be garbage collected. And we're back to the simple world where we just have the stack and computation completes. It's the same if we just return after capture. We uh, we have that value that we're returning. We copy the stack into the current working stack and deliver the value there. And then again, it can be garbage collected. So these two pointers work the same, but they're different shaped pointers because one of them looks like a function for our continuation invocation, the one on the left. The one on the right uh, looks like a return address. So to explain how this works in more detail, then I make the picture even more detailed. So now I'm drawing in each frame, um, simulating a return address by saying, return to the code that's doing that thing. So I return to the code for our whole applied to v2, uh, return to the code for v1 applied, and so on. And then our initial, uh, initial return address here uh, is return to exit. All uh, right, what does it mean then when we uh, want to copy the stack? I'm going to make the stack base uh, explicit as a register and the frame explicit as register. Frame has always been implicit in the pictures, but let's make, a, make it explicit. So when call CC wants to split the stack, what that means is that it moves uh, 
Well, it's going to make a, something to represent the capture continuation, so this new record on the right, which refers to the old stack. Meanwhile, stack base gets adjusted up to the new, new frame. So this is that splitting of the stack that I showed by actually separating the blocks before, but now I'm leaving them together because in memory they stay, stay contiguous. Is everyone with me so far? Any question? Yes? Just uh, one clarification. So the thing you've shown on the right there, uh, have you actually physically copied the stack over there at that point, or is this just a pointer? That's just a pointer. So that little, the, the yellow box on the right, the beige box there, that's a new record that I just allocated. Uh, and I'm going to make a little bit better use of it. I'm, that, that record ultimately is going to be the thing that I, that I use to represent the continuation. Right. But it didn't copy the stack. It just has these pointers that refer to the stack. So all the red arrows are pointer arrows. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, stepped a couple of more slides here. In this record is also the old frame uh, and the portion of the stack that we called. So this is the old stack base register, the old frame register, and then the old return address. So the return address is the code that we return to to start running the rest of the stack. But I've taken it away from this frame that captures the continuation. Um, this record is going to go into yet another parallel list, the next stack list. And the return address is going to be changed to underflow. So the call CC did a bunch of things here. It allocated this new record, installed some pointers to what used to be the old state of the continuation, including the return address. Uh, it split the stack by moving the stack base register. Uh, it put this new record into the next stack chain. So there's really a kind of meta, meta stack here in the next stack that's keeping a list of segments. Uh, and by setting the return address to underflow, that means that this code um, tries to just return, and then the actual code at underflow uh, does a continuation application. So it says, oh, what is the, what is the pointer next stack referring to? That's where I need to return to. So underflow is an indirection to get to this address in this case. Still, still OK? Any questions at this point? So in other words, we got these stack segments linked together through next stack. So we've got a hybrid stack keep implementation of continuations. Uh, when we actually apply that continuation then, uh, we look at the records that it that is pointed to here. So we're applying this continuation. Look at this record. It identifies this region uh, as the old stack because it's got the stack base and the frame. So continuing to the end of that frame, uh, that is the part that we want to copy. So this is where we do the copy. We're doing it on uh, continuation invocation. We copy it up into our current stack. Uh, we adjust the frame pointer based on the relative position of the recorded frame pointer. Uh, and we deliver the return address there and start, uh, start working there. Meanwhile, we also need to pop the, 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 this continuation that we just applied. So we, um, it has one more pointer referring to uh, the rest of the next stack. So we do that. And then at this point, if you look at stack base and frame at next stack, uh, they only reach this part. And again, the part that we're not referring to can be GC'd away. Okay, so split stack. When we split the stack, we got different objects as far as the GC is concerned, and it can throw away the old stack uh, since it's not referenced anymore. Uh, before I move on, then, any questions there? Returning to the continuation is going to be exactly the same thing. Uh, if we return here, underflow just says do a continuation application. So it'll do the same sort of copying work and eventually allow the GC to fire. So that's how you implement first class continuations using stacks, or more specifically, a stack heap hybrid. Uh, pausing just a little bit more for questions. All right, so then we talk about marks in this setting. So now I've got all of my uh, all of my stacks in place here. I've got the regular continuation stack. I have a kind of the meta the meta you know meta stack uh, list here in next stack and at the mark stack, which I'm assuming is empty in this example. But here we've gotten to with mark. So what does with mark do? It takes the uh, the key mapping v7 v12 and puts a new record into the marks list. And then with mark proceeds with tail evaluation 
Oh, actually, with Mark has to do more. <laughs> Before we go on to uh, to evaluate, it's not enough to just push marks. We need to record how this gets popped off. Right? Eventually, this expression will return, and we need to pop off the mark stack. And the way we do that is take advantage of the continuation machinery that's already there. We reify the continuation in the same way that call CC does, which means we split the stack, we create this continuation record, uh, it has a return to the old address, and so on. And we update this record so that now it also points to the old marks. So this is like creating that extra little special continuation frame that says, when we return through here, we need to update the marks. To do that, we just use the already kind of special handling we had to do with returns to captured continuations. Now with Mark can proceed with evaluation uh, to uh, its body expression. We have with Mark again. This time we map V7 to V13. So we make an updated dictionary um, that we're going to put in marks, but we don't reify the continuation a second time because underflow is already the return address. So what withmark does before it reifies the current continuation, just like call CC does, as it turns out, it checks whether the return address is already underflow. If it is, then that means we don't need to reify. It's already reified, and we can just update the mark stack instead. Any question on that? When this expression evaluates to a value, then we're going to return that value. Returning will trigger the underflow. And so we do this usual sort of continuation return. We copy that portion of the stack. Um, in addition to all the other things, we update um, this marks register based on the pointer that was in the applied continuation. And then all the part in gray is now garbage. And we continue again with the simple picture where we have empty marks. Um, empty next stack chain, and just keep continuing applying v3 to v2. So uh, because we set things up just right, this was all very simple. With mark does the same thing as call cc, and the only extra thing it does is update the, the marks list. And then when you return, then the continuation popping uh, takes care of things. Similarly, if you use call cc to capture the continuation, then the captured reified continuation has a suitable reference to the marks list. And so the marks get reset as they should uh, when you apply the continuation later. Right, so this is a complete implementation. It's not as efficient as we want, but this is another good point to check for questions. So I'm guessing you're next going to talk about linear uses of continuations, is that right? Yep, that is exactly right. <laughs> this copy is not really needed uh, that we did for continuation marks much of the time. Right? Because when we, we reified the continuation for with mark, but no one actually captured the continuation. Um, so we know that this continuation is only going to be returned to once. So how do we do that? Um, when with mark is the one that reifies this frame, it also sets a little flag on the frame that says this is a one-shot continuation. We'll, re we'll return to this continuation at most once. If that flag is intact, and if the current stack base is just after the stack that we will re return to, then when we return to that, we do it the cheap way. We just move the stack base pointer back down to here, effectively reunifying these pieces of the stack, um, and then keep going as we would with a normal return. So this is called an optimist, opportunistic one-shot continuation because it might not work out by the time you get here. Reason being, someone might call call CC after with continuation mark, uh, reify the continuation. Call CC is just going to remove this flag. If, it, if there's a reified continuation but has a flag, call CC removes it. It turns out this functionality was already built into Shea Scheme because it had a notion of, of one-shot continuation. Um, and another reason this uh, is opportunistic, it, it's not just that the flag has to be there, but the stacks still have to be next to each other. After we split the stack, there were different objects from the GC's perspective, so it might move them far apart. Um, so this underflow return here is going to have to do a check. Is the one-shot flag still there? Are the stacks still contiguous? If so, then it can take the shortcut. But as you might imagine, um, when you use with marks, uh, without capturing the continuation. And when it's short-lived, so there wasn't a GC in between there, uh, then this, this opportunity happens quite frequently. Any question on that? All right. 
Um, other optimizations have to do with more what um, Oed was saying before, which is, uh, you know, you don't really want to create frames for every sub-expression. Like if you have a plus sub-expression, uh, you don't need to create a plus extra frame for this. You just do it in line because it's a primitive, and you recognize it's a primitive, and so on. Um, so uh, that when do you create a frame? It's when you have a function call for an arbitrary function that you don't recognize. In that case is when you do create a frame. So with marks interact with this in, uh, in, a, in a mostly op obvious but not entirely obvious way. So when you have with mark inside of a plus, for example, we want to just do the E3 in the same frame. So you know the compiler can statically detect these kinds of with marks. It will do the push operation. It'll keep the with mark there in a sense as it evaluates the body expression. If that body expression it, um, is something like a, a primitive value, operation, we're going to keep doing that in the same frame. And once we get a value back to get it outside the with mark, then there's a pop operation that happens. Right? So just because we use myth mark doesn't actually mean we need a new frame, much less a, a reification of the continuation. And the compiler statically detects that situation. Uh, on the other hand, if the compiler sees a with mark that's nested inside of a primitive, but it's a, a general function call, then we do have to make a frame. Uh, the way that works, though, is that we do this push in line, and it's only when we get to the non-tail call of an arbitrary function that we not only create a new frame, but also reify the continuation just as if uh, with mark had been done the other way. So you can have a with mark whose body leads to either a primitive or a general call. Um, Maybe, a, maybe it's a primitive because it's a fixed num plus, uh, or you have to fall out to a general plus. And so you could decide at the point of the, of the non-tail call whether you need to reify the continuation at all. In other words, the compiler has different handlings for different kinds of non-tail calls based on where they are with respect to, uh, to with mark. And building that in gives you the right kind of optimizer runtime um, performance cooperation. Any question on this? Because this is that's it. That's all the implementation details I'm going to throw at you. All right. Naturally, I've gone a little bit longer than I expected, so let's just wrap up here. Um, overall, the benefit of building this into the compiler and runtime system in the way I've described um, made continuation and mark operations, you know, the current mark and things like that, three to 20 times as fast uh, as doing it just on the outside using call CC. That translates into a factor of three or so for contracts, which use continuation marks fairly directly, um, or 10 or 25% on applications. And we can break it down on what was it about what I've described that, that contributes to performance, and it's really everything. It's the, the representation, uh, the different optimizations I showed you, including opportunistic one-shot continuations. Uh, so a success as far as we were concerned, as um, both over a couple of decades, continuation marks have let us implement various kinds of language features. Um, and you know, by doing this now with a, a good performing scheme base, uh, we can show definitively that it's compatible with, with an optimizing compiler uh, and getting all the different kinds of control that we want. Uh, and the specific implementation used uh, stack-based continuations, really a stack-heap hybrid, uh, and those specific operations, optimizations. So that's what I've got. So happy to take any further questions you may have. Thanks. Um, we're waiting for people to raise their hand for questions. We usually have a little clapping session in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I see Brian started and, and so on. OK, I, I have a question, if that's OK. OK, sure. Um, so zooming out on the implementation, um, you know, we, one way to view it is you've changed the, the data structure of the stack from a stack to something else, right? So, so you know, going back to, to complexity 101, Right. Uh, what are the operations on this data structure? What are the complexities that you can't have? Do you have an amortized analysis of those operations? And, I, and do sorry. you have an idea as how to? Oh, sorry about that. No, so my it's, problem it's, is I wanted to switch off screen sharing, and then that distracted me from. Yeah, I can't oh, I see. How to okay. do that. Uh, the right. If you go to right, there's like a little stop button. Uh, if I'm you move your cursor up. Okay. 
Right. Oh, there it is. Yep. Got it. Okay. Excellent. Sorry, uh, now I can pay attention properly. That's okay. okay. Happy to. So <laughs> stick my my face on it. Um, okay. So so go, one thing you've done is you've changed the data structure from a stack to something else. Okay. So so uh -huh. you know if you think about it in terms of you know data structures one on one kind of course right. So we, you you list the yep. operations, you list the complexity, uh, and then you try to do some model analysis. Um, of, of course, that's a bit different what we're trying to do. But have you started thinking about that? Do you have some some stories that and so on? Well, along those lines, one thing that's relevant is how you look up the marks, which I totally didn't didn't talk about. Um, and I said that an iterator is the right sort of primitive in terms of those computational complexity. But in fact, we use with. There's actually current mark as a built-in thing because uh, it can do it efficiently and it can cache. Uh, the result in such a way that you get amortized constant time for lookup of the of the current mark. So I have glossed over some of those, but I think it's getting at your question and that we did have to think about um, the operations and the complexity of those operations. So if you want all the marks for a given key, that's going to cost you time proportional to the continuation. If you want just the, the most recent mark, that's a constant time. So dynamic variable lookup can be fast. Um, and if you want to iterate through things, that's going to cost you time proportional to the depth of the continuation that you have to traverse uh, to get to get as far as you want. Um, so, so yes, absolutely. <laughs> did I, did I cover the question? Yeah, no, that's great. And, and, and can I find that information in the in a paper, or is it, is it in your head? Or you know, it's it's sort of only it? sketched. There should probably be another supplement to say here's more details on how you implement. Uh, mm -hmm. The paper just says basically what I said. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Cache it halfway. You know, do the obvious. Use use a nice data structure. Good luck. <laughs> That's what it says currently. We have a question for Sam. Okay. Hi, Sam. Hi. Oh, I'm trying to share my video now. Ah, hi. Um, so you have this obvious op optimization in the this opportunis opportunistic one-shot optimization. Uh, is that going to work if you're trying to do something like uh, coroutines, where you might actually be storing them away in some sort of queue and you have some sort of scheduler? Yeah. Uh, so in fact, in our current implementation, coroutines use full continuations. So that does defeat the opportunistic part. Um, I think it doesn't matter in the sense that if we are s swapping continuations, then then we're paying similar kinds of costs yeah. anyway. Basically, um, you need to live on the heap somewhere anyway if you're going to do. Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. Shea scheme it has a, a pre-existing notion of one-shot continuation that was intended for things like coroutines, but it doesn't perform as well. Like every time, and and Kent would say this too. It just didn't work out. Uh, it turns out that the base general implementation of continuations is so fast uh, that trying to do other things to save time over here just doesn't doesn't pan out. So that's partly, so you're absolutely right. And we use threads in the sense of coroutines a lot, coroutine style threads a lot in Racket. And it does mean every time you do a context switch, we are sort of reifying the continuation and, and uh, if necessary, the mark frames that go with it. Just quickly batting in, is this okay. thousands of threads or millions of? I mean, how, what's the how often? Oh, do typically you... dozens, but it can be ten thousand. You know, it scales well to ten thousand. Okay, um, millions, probably not. Each thread record is uh, is hundreds of bytes, probably. So, millions is going to be pushing it. Hmm. On systems like Erlang, do millions? Yes, I think we're not as lightweight as Erlang, although probably somewhere small constant factor uh, bigger than Erlang, I think. Hmm. Maybe if I, you have enough memory. I haven't tried these days. Maybe there's so much memory. All right. <laughs> Just uh, sort of pushing on your one-shot optimization thing again. Um, so I mean, it, it does work for the kind of trivial cases where, where you're literally doing kind of a tail call type yep. thing. And have you have you benchmarked the cost there? I mean, is it is it pretty much zero, as in, if you, uh, if you write the program to not actually do anything with continuations? And oh yes, that right that was very important to to make the costs zero for programs that don't use it, or as close as we could get. So we there's extensive benchmarks in the paper. 
to try to, to tease out these questions. Um, but just in terms of implementation, what do we actually force on programs? We force on programs that do use continuations but not marks, we force that extra pointer in the continuation record. Uh, but on programs that don't use continuations or marks, there's no cost at all um, compared to what was there before. Right, and my question is about a program that maybe unnecessarily uses continuations, but ah. only in a, in a harmless way that can always be opportunistically optimized. So we, um, like we haven't tried to analyze a use of call CC to say actually that capture continuation is a one-shot continuation. Um, that would that would be nuts. I mean, in simple cases, it could be done. Um, but I, very little of our code would allow that to fire with our current analysis technique, at least. Uh, one thing we did do, call CC, you know, takes a, a, a function as its argument. And absent any optimization, that function is a closure that has to be allocated. But our compiler now recognizes when call CC is used in a tail position, that it can just reify the same way that with mark does, and it doesn't, and then just can continue to uh, pass that along to the body. So, so there's some closure eliminations that happen, but no analysis to detect when something's actually one shot, even though the program uses a more general form. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. I suggest we, we wrap up the official discussion. We can continue um, right. and, you know, offline. So, so just uh, let's thank Matthew again for for. Uh, nice talk early in the morning. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>